States. It has already been a very long campaign season for the man that you saw there, his jaw jutting out in disappointment, Donald Trump. And it's really starting to show, I got to say. I mean, let's, again, to be just human here for a second, uh, say, you know, relate to a person on stage, their mic doesn't work. Campaigning for president is hard. It's physically and emotionally, psychologically grueling. It's difficult for any candidate. It's particularly got to be really hard for the 78-year-old man who is the oldest major party nominee in U.S. history. Have you seen him lately? I mean, he is out there. He's given two, two and a half hour speeches, just word salads. You, you, you have no idea what he's talking about. He's talking about Hannibal Lecter. He's talking about this. He's talking about that. He's swaying to Ave Maria and YMCA for about half an hour. Folks are standing there not sure what's happening. Can you imagine if 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 I did that, now, I think those concerns about competency are one of the reasons why one of the defining features of Trump's third campaign is how it's largely been sealed off in this alternate world of safe spaces, friendly interviews with right wing outlets, softball podcasts, a town hall that devolved into a bizarre wordless dance recital uh, set to Trump's comfort playlist. When Trump rarely does step out for a more traditional interview, he is forced to answer real questions on issues like his fitness for office. And he just can't do it. You own and run businesses. Yeah. Would you appoint a CEO who was 78? And you'd yeah. give you a, oh, yeah. a medical... Some of this, yeah, I would. Depends on... This. I've met people like, like Biden, who's in bad shape. I wouldn't... Have... I know many people in their 80s. I know guys in their 80s that won't leave the company, like family companies, where they don't want the kids to take over, because they're much more competent than their kids. You know, I took two cognitive tests, and I, I aced them both. I think that, frankly, people regardless should take if they're 50 or 40 or I think people should take cognitive tests not because of the age but because of something else something else what's the something else now considering all that it should probably come as a little surprise that Trump has canceled a number of mainstream interviews in the final stretch of the campaign his team is citing exhaustion for anyone who's been following along there's no doubt that Donald Trump really is tired and again I get it as the Harris Walls campaign noted on social media, quote, an exhausted Trump appeared to fall asleep during his campaign event in Michigan today. At that same event, he even complained about having to campaign. How about we'll go through it pretty quick, Dale, and then I'm going over to make a little speech in front of 10,000 people. You think this is an easy life I have, right? <laughs> I go from here, I say, am I finished? They say, no, sir, you have uh, one more speech. Oh, good, where is it? What is it, 20 minutes, 30 minutes away? He does not look like he's enjoying himself. Now, Donald Trump has always been one of the absolute weirder figures in American public life. He's always said really disgusting and bigoted things, and he has never hit his authoritarian desire. So all, none of that's new. But even grading on a curve for him, it seems as though every time he gets in front of a microphone these days, what comes out of his mouth is a combination of incoherent and offensive. I was so amazed that Harvey Weinstein got Schlonged. He got hit as hard as you can get hit because he was sort of the king of the woke, right? Lincoln was probably a great president, although I've always said, why wasn't that settled? You know, I'm a guy that it doesn't make sense. We had a civil war. Do you find it weird they're not interested about why Kamala Harris was not at the Capitol on January 6th, mm -hmm. but was at the DNC when yeah. a pipe bomb was outside? Yeah, it's interesting. Why, why does they say, oh, yes, we're building cars. They don't build cars. They take them out of a box and they assemble them. We could have our child do it. It's a rigged deal. The whole thing is rigged. Why are they still being held? Nobody's ever been treated like this. Nobody's yeah. ever. Maybe the Japanese during Second World War, frankly. Uh, but, you know, they were held, too. I think we have more of an enemy from within than we do from outside. These are bad people. These are sick people and bad people. Is cocaine a stronger uh, oh, yeah. up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cocaine so you, so you're way up with cocaine more than anything else you can think of. What's your favorite farm animal? I'll tell you what I love. I love cows. But if we go with Kamala, you won't have any cows. I like conversation. Uh, I don't seem to get myself in much trouble. Now, just to be clear, when he was talking uh, to, to, I think it was Dan Bongino, uh, about who it was that was treated like the Japanese in internment, he was referring to the January 6th folks 
who've been arrested and prosecuted and, and imprisoned for attempting to sack the capital. That's who he was comparing to the Japanese who are interned. Now, so all of that, you get a little sense there. That's how Donald Trump's campaign is going. Kamala Harris, on the other hand, is running a very active campaign. She's taking every opportunity to highlight the contrast between her and Trump. And now he is ducking debates and canceling interviews. Come on. And, and check this out. His own campaign team recently said it is because of exhaustion. <laughs> well, if you are exhausted on the campaign trail, it raises real questions about whether you are fit for the toughest job in the world. Come on. Come on. Donald Trump's response today likely did little to assuage concerns about his fitness for office. What event did I cancel? I haven't canceled. She doesn't go to any events. She's a loser. She doesn't go to any events. She didn't even show up for the Catholics last night at the hotel. It was insulting. Uh, they All they are is sound bites. So today, I was at Fox & Friends at 7 in the morning. I then went to two different uh, other appearances. I then made about 15 phone calls. I've gone 48 days now without a rest. And I've got that loser who doesn't have the energy of a rabbit. Now, that's, of course, a, a, a lie. Kamala Harris does tons of media, including the traditional outlets that Trump dodges. She even sat down for a very adversarial interview with Fox News just this week. In fact, a key part of that campaign is showing voters exactly what Donald Trump has been saying. She did so again today. Because there's simply no denying that her 78-year-old opponent is incoherent and exhausted and floundering on the campaign trail with less than two weeks to go. Seems like maybe a bad idea to have him on the country, but what do I know? Lindsay Johnson's a Democratic strategist who served as a senior advisor for the Biden-Harris 2020 campaign. David Jolly is a former Republican congressman of Florida, and they both join me now. Um, it's interesting to me, Alencia, with, with Donald Trump, it has always been an issue of where you attack him if you're a political opponent, particularly a Democrat. There's a lot to say. Um, and, and in some ways, there's so much to say it overwhelms. But this sort of idea of unfitness, which I, I can't tell if that's an argument to voters or it's also just a way of needling him. W what do you think of that argument, which I think obviously is, is pretty merited at this point? Listen, I, I think you've seen that the Democratic Party and the Harris campaign sees that this is actually an argument that could persuade voters to not vote for him, to maybe stay home or just vote or, or even more importantly, vote for Vice President Harris because they put out a campaign ad today calling him unfit and unstable. Here's what's really interesting and why it's so strategic and smart for Vice President Harris and the campaign to do this is because every time that she hits him about being unstable, about being weak, about being unfit for office, it chips away at his bravado style of politics and campaigning, and he can't actually campaign on issues. He's flailing and completely going off the rails and trying to push back on these allegations that, quite frankly, the more that he plays into them, the worse he looks, which helps Democrats up and down the ticket, including Vice President Harris. And so I think it's a strong campaign strategy in that it's a quick campaign strategy for the vice president's campaign. They can hit him about being unfit and unstable and then also talk about policy positions when all he can do is respond to this. Yeah. I, he, by the way, I think his mic is back, so he's back talking again. I, I want to, you mentioned the ad, and I want to play this for you, David, and get your thoughts on it, because I thought an interesting sure. hybrid of the sort of he's unhinged, he has authoritarian aspirations, and then a very kind of meat and potatoes midsection of this very quick 30-second ad. Take a listen. Donald Trump makes a lot of promises, but we can be sure of one thing. If he wins, he'll ignore all checks that rein in a president's power. It's all in Trump's Project 2025 agenda. What does that mean for you? Higher cost on groceries, cuts to Social Security and Medicare, more tax breaks for billionaires, and a national abortion ban putting women's health at risk. A second Trump term, more unhinged, unstable, and unchecked. Interesting ad, David. Yeah, Chris, I think it's fascinating because we are entering the period where we're seeing the closing argument. And I think to Alencia's point, it may be that the vice president is choosing to make her closing argument, not necessarily about her own policy platform, which she's proposed many policies, but about Donald Trump's fitness. And 
I think what it also indicates is there are very few gettable voters out there. But the most gettable voters are probably the voters that are concerned about Donald Trump's fitness. Maybe it's the danger to democracy argument, but it is the chaos argument you hear yeah. the vice president make, the word unhinged. Those are the persuadable voters that are left. And then contrast that with Donald Trump. He's doing nothing to reach those voters. If anything, his closing argument is pushing those voters farther away. And so you saw her reach out to soft Republicans in Bucks County, Pennsylvania this week. You're seeing this notion of the president being unhinged. Sure, she's going to hit on those quick policy points like you saw, particularly on reproductive freedom. But I think her closing argument is an acknowledgement that this decision this year is about Donald Trump and whether or not he is a safe person to return to the White House. It's a powerful argument. Interviews abruptly canceled, angry and extreme outbursts about his critics, diatribes about everything from world leaders to sharks and fictional serial killers. 18 days to Election Day here in the United States and concerns they are mounting about the mental acuity of the oldest presidential nominee in American history. And the red flags, they are being raised not just by the media or by Democrats. Donald Trump's own allies, they are now worried about his ability to stay on track. The New York Times reporting, quote, at a time when his opponent, Vice President Kamala Harris, has stepped up her attacks on him as unstable, Mr. Trump has struggled to publicly hone his message by veering off script and ramping up personal attacks on Ms. Harris that allies have urged him to rein in. Veering off script? Well, that may be an understatement. This, what you are about to watch, just from the past week. Should Google be breaking up? I just haven't gotten over something the Justice Department did yesterday, where Virginia cleaned up its voter rolls and got rid of thousands and thousands of bad votes, and the Justice Department sued them that they should be allowed to put those bad votes and illegal votes back in and let the people vote. So I haven't, I, I haven't gotten. I haven't gotten over that. A lot of people have seen that. They can't even believe it. The question is about Google, President Trump. If my guys can hear me, two things. Put up the chart, my favorite chart. <laughs> my all-time favorite chart. And let's listen to Pavarotti sing Ave Maria. Because Biden was obviously cognitively repaired. She should have reported him because that puts our nation in danger. We've never been so close to being in World War III than we are right now. And don't kid yourself, we have an election coming up, but we still have like three and a half months left. And it's a long time in a nuclear world. And uh, that would be a war like no other. And I'm not thrilled about the people representing us, even for a short period of time. The election was three and a half weeks away, not months, when he said that. And if the endless series of non sequiturs, outbursts, nonsensical answers wasn't strange enough, Donald Trump has become downright flaky as the presidential campaign gets down to the wire. From Politico, quote, it's become something of a pattern. Trump is scheduled for an interview with a neutral media outlet. The date nears and then things fall apart. It happened just this week to planned Trump sit downs with NBC in Philadelphia and CNBC's Squawk Box. And that's on the heels of him backing out of a 60 Minutes episode earlier this month. According to Team Trump, their candidate is exhausted. More from Politico, quote, the Trump campaign had been in conversations for weeks with the Shade Room about a sit-down interview. The site, which draws an audience that is largely young and black, hosts an interview with Harris just last week. In a conversation earlier this week, when describing why an interview had not come together just yet, a Trump advisor told the Shade Room producers that Trump was, quote, exhausted and refusing some interviews, but that could change at any time. But not too tired for his favorite network and his favorite morning show. Here he is on Fox and Friends, where he had to say stuff like this. Well, Lincoln was probably a great president, although I've always said, why wasn't that settled? You know, I'm a guy that it doesn't make sense. We had a civil war. Well, half the country uh, left horrible. before he got there. Yeah, yeah. But you'd almost say, like, why wasn't that... As an example, Ukraine would have never happened in Russia if I were president. 
the weave, you know. An exhausted Donald Trump also somehow found time for a podcast with Fox News star Dan Bugino when th where this happened. I'm just a, just a slight tad bit younger, but you remember 1980s Times Square pre Giuliani? Yeah. You know, remember the Folexes, the fake Rolexes, yeah. and then yeah. all the peep shows and stuff? I mean, some of the scammers were good. Remember the Shell Game guys? That's like, right. they were good. Like, so right. that's them. Like, if you're going to be good at a scammer, you might as well be good at it. That's the, what 60 The press is a big scam. Oh, it's it's terrible. It's, you know, I don't know that a country can come back if it has a fake press. It's hard. Because they're like the policemen. You know, they're like, they keep people honest, right? But. Democrats don't have to be honest. They really don't have to be honest because they're not going to they will never be accused of anything. It's interesting. Uh, I was so amazed that Harvey Weinstein got schlonged. He got hit as hard as you can get hit because he was sort of the king of the world, right? Yeah. And yet he got hit. And I figured that maybe he wouldn't get hit so hard. But boy, did he get uh, you don't know him well. I don't know him well. Ah, uh, yes, Harvey Weinstein, well-known king of the woke. But don't worry, Donald Trump, he says he is just fine. I am the most stable human being. Remember they said uh, a stable genius. I am the most stable <laughs> human being. I've been doing this for a long time. And that, all that, is where we start today. MSNBC political analyst Mara Gay joins us. She's editorial board member with The New York Times. Plus, Reverend Al Sharpton is here. He is the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network. And this weekend, he's going to be interviewing Vice President Kamala Harris in Atlanta. We're going to talk more about that forthcoming interview a little later on. Also with us, MSNBC columnist and contributor Charlie Sykes and NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. All right, Vaughn, um, 19 days to Election Day. Trump is on TV saying Abraham Lincoln should have cut a deal to avoid the Civil War. He goes on a podcast to talk about how prosecutors threw the book at Harvey <clears throat> Weinstein. Just did I get all that right? Is that where we are? I, I think that that's pretty accurate. There's not exactly a campaign focus, largely because the candidate himself doesn't stay focused on one specific message. And, you, you know, his reference to somehow Abraham Lincoln should have settled the before the Civil War started between the Union and the Confederacy, of course, what exactly would a, a settlement look like? Would that include slavery? The best effort was the Crittenden Compromise, which would have added a constitutional amendment that would have allowed the South to maintain slavery. And so Donald Trump, though, you know, also so in the Fox and Friends appearance, he was talking about that Kamala Harris would supposedly ban cows and get rid of cows, which is just a misrepresentation of the Green New Deal. But this is where you see the Republican nominee just over two weeks out, despite sometimes the best efforts of his campaign to build events around focused around immigration or the economy, their candidate has a much different tenor. And just to underscore, the media interviews that he decides to do are podcasts that are very friendly towards him, but also the likes of Fox and Friends, which we should note, that type of interview that played out this morning was a stark contrast to the one that the Vice President Harris did with Brett Baer just 48 hours ago. So, more, I want to correct myself. I said 19 days. It is 18 days. We all have the right to misspeak. There's the misspeaking, and then there is the exhaustion. If you're too exhausted to talk to the shade room, are you potentially too exhausted to be President of the United States? Ooh, well, right. I mean, what Vaughn is identifying here is it's not just an issue for the campaign that Donald Trump is veering off script. I think a central issue that he has in, in making this closing argument is he isn't going to win with just his base. And much of the appeal of Trumpism that I hear uh, when I talk to voters that we see in polls is this, and I think it's a false idea, but this idea that he's strong, that he projects strength and leadership, mm -hmm. and this idea that he's an outsider and that a vote for him is uh, a rational choice for Americans who somehow feel disaffected by the political system. Now, I don't believe that Donald Trump actually has solutions for those Americans, but that is a large part of the appeal that you hear when you talk to voters at rallies and on the trail. The problem is, that the reality of Donald Trump himself and who he is is, of course, just none of those things. Um, he's a threat to democracy. He has nothing to offer the American people other than uh, more, you know, grift um, for his own benefit in the next four years. And I think the more we hear from Donald Trump himself on the trail, 
the more obvious that becomes to voters, it's harder to really take seriously this notion that he would be a strong leader or that he somehow cares about Americans who feel like the political system hasn't served them when you actually listen to what he's saying. So he is really his own worst enemy on the campaign trail, which is not the closing argument that you need in a close race 18 days out from Election Day. But we begin tonight with just 18 days left before the election. Both Vice President Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are spending the day in the important battleground state of Michigan. It is Harris's second day in the Rust Belt. She chose to speak to voters in Wisconsin yesterday rather than appear last night in person at the annual Al Smith Dinner, hosted by the Archdiocese of New York, an event that is typically attended by both presidential candidates during an election year. It usually includes the candidates lightheartedly roasting each other. The vice president did send a video that included comedian Molly Shannon reprising her Saturday Night Live character, Mary Catherine Gallagher. Is there anything that you think that maybe I shouldn't bring up tonight? Um, well, don't lie. Thou shall not bear false witness to thy neighbor. Indeed, especially thy neighbor's election results. Just so you know, there will be a fact checker there tonight. Oh, that's great. Who? Jesus. And maybe don't say anything negative about Catholics. I would never do that, no matter where I was. That would be like criticizing Detroit in Detroit. <laughs> Trump did appear in person, but, you know, maybe he should have sat this one out. While perhaps entertaining some of his supporters, many of his jokes either bombed or were just plain tasteless. But apparently Joe didn't think it was fair for me to have the podium to myself with Kamala skipping the event. So he called, looked at me, and said, don't. <laughs> Does anybody understand that? Yes. <laughs> that was, I thought it was actually very good until just now. I'm surprised that Bill de Blasio was actually able to make it tonight, to be honest. He was a terrible mayor. I don't give a shit if this is comedy or not. Right now, we have someone in the White House who can barely talk, barely put together two coherent sentences, who seems to have mental faculties of a child, it's sad. There's a person that has nothing going, no intelligence whatsoever, but enough about Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, Donald, if you're going to try to make a joke about someone who can barely talk and put two sentences together, maybe you should be able to say the words yourself or risk becoming the butt of the joke, something I know that you're used to. Also, imagine being in a room full of Catholic clergy and feeling free to drop a cuss bomb. I'm sure he'll ask for forgiveness the next time he attends church. Oh, yeah, that's right. He never goes to church, nor, according to him, ever asks God for forgiveness. It was actually a bit of a surprise to see Trump appear at the Smith dinner last night, considering his campaign has been pulling him out of events and interviews left and right, including with 60 Minutes, CNBC, NBC News, and even a rally with the very Trump-friendly NRA. Political reported today that Trump was also in talks to sit down with the social media outfit The Shade Room, presumably to court black voters. But like the others, that fell through. Political rights. A Trump advisor told the Shade Room producers that Trump was exhausted and refusing some interviews, but that that could change at any time, according to two people familiar with the conversations. VP Harris responded to that report from the campaign trail. I've been hearing reports that his team at least is saying he's suffering from exhaustion. And um, that's apparently the excuse for why he's not doing interviews. And, of course, he's not doing the CNN town hall. Um, he refuses to do another debate. And, you know, look, being president of the United States is probably one of the hardest jobs in the world. And so we really do need to ask if he's exhausted being on the campaign trail, um, is he fit to do the job? And I think that's a question that is an open-ended question that he needs to answer. Do remember, this comes from the oldest nominee ever to run for president, who is unwilling to release his medical records and who claimed just three days ago that he is far healthier than all the other former presidents and Kamala Harris, too.
I don't know, maybe he's canceling all these interviews because he's just afraid of having to take real challenging questions from those who are not his MAGA sycophants. That could explain why he went back to his safe space this morning on the comfy couch over at Fox, where he was given free reign to say whatever he wants to the nodding approval of his devout followers, including the one sitting behind, sitting beside him on the sofa. I am the most stable human being. Remember they said uh, a stable genius. I am the most stable <laughs> human being. I've been doing this for a long time. I hate to talk that way, but we can't let this woman mm -hmm. get in. It's two people. And she's a very, and you talk about unstable, she's a whack job. Hmm. He also let it slip that some people over at Fox helped write some of the so-called jokes he delivered last night at the Smith dinner. And he gave an open endorsement to a key element of Project 2025 on education. We're going to take the Department of Education, close it. I'm going to close it. We'll have one person, could be you if you decide to retire. So let's say you have a liberal city, let's say it's Los Angeles, San Diego, and they just decide, they, oh, we're going to get rid of that history. We got new history. This is America built off the backs of slaves on stolen land. Then and that curriculum comes in. Then we don't send them money. Did the brother on the set have any thoughts? Maybe not. Uh, people may wonder how we got here. That somebody this incapable would, could possibly return to the Oval Office. Well, for that, you can look at his performance on Fox this morning, which is a reminder that he is ultimately nothing more than a television performer. Being on TV is his comfort place. And that is largely because of his time on The Apprentice. If not for that show, which created the fictional TV version of Trump that audiences saw, he may never have wound up in the White House in the first place. Speaking to producers on the show, the New York Times pointed out last month how Apprentice producers had to cover for Trump, who at times had no idea what was going on on the show, especially when it came to firing someone. The Times writes, quote, for those moments when Mr. Trump's choice threatened to reflect badly on him and the show, Mark Burnett's producers waved their magic wands in the editing bay. Our job then was to reverse engineer the show and to make him not look like a complete moron, Mr. Braun said. They would go back through the tape from the week and selectively choose snippets to make the person who he fired look not as good. 